Hello, and welcome. Uh, I'm so glad you all are able to join us. I am happy to welcome you all to a special episode of Hammering It Out, our occasional talk show slash fireside chat slash deep dive into special topics, uh, foundry related and foundry adjacent. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, and I am accompanied by a couple of very special guests. Uh, firstly, from our very own team, I've got Kim, who is one of our uh, lead developers and uh, responsible for making all of the amazing Foundry content that you come to enjoy. I'm also joined by Eothis, the uh, scattered god himself. All right. Kim is representing himself well already. Um, we're, bo we're both super excited about this stream because both Kim and I are big fans of um, our guests today. Um, most notably of whom is Josh Sawyer, who is a game designer who both Kim and I have admired for some time and uh, greatly enjoyed his work. So Josh, why don't you give everyone a quick introduction? Hey everybody, my name is Josh Sawyer. I'm the studio design director at Obsidian Entertainment. Uh, and I directed, well, let's see, going all the way back to the late 90s, I worked on Icewind Dale and Icewind Dale 2 at Black Isle Studios. And then more recently, I think people know me from uh, Fall at New Vegas, which I directed. And I also directed Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2. And I am the designer of the Pillars of Eternity tabletop role-playing game. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we're, we're, so, we're so excited to have you join us. Uh, this is going to be a fun chat. And um, speaking of the Pillars of Eternity tabletop role-playing game, we also have Russell, a.k.a. Moo Man here, who's well known to many of you in the Foundry community for his fantastic work. Uh, on a variety of Foundry game systems, but uh, Russell's here because he's directly involved in that effort. Russell, why don't you introduce yourself and tee up what you're doing? Oh, I am Russell, known as Moo Man. Um, I'm a community developer here, and my main work is generally um, any of the Warhammer systems, but I've been, um, have had the honor to uh, work on this Pillars of Eternity adaptation sort of uh, going back full circle from CRPG to tabletop to virtual tabletop. So it's been an awesome experience and I can't wait to show it off in any fashion. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's probably a common thread for so many people, both who are directly involved in creating Foundry as well as involved in using Foundries that we all have uh, really strong and, and fond CRPG roots that kind of led us to love role-playing games, but to, to really want to enjoy them in a sort of hybrid format that brings technology and, and brings, uh, you know, some aspects of, of CRPG game design into our space. And, and that's something that really shows up really commonly. Um, and so it's no surprise that we are all big fans of, um, you know, Obsidian and, and Josh's work. And then of course, Russell with your work as well. Um, I, I want to jump into things by, by letting Josh, letting you tell people a little bit about, I guess the backstory of Pillars of Eternity and, and the, the, the game system itself a little bit. Cause I think there's some interesting detail there. Um, you know, my understanding is that, you know, you were a, a personal champion for Obsidian to do the Kickstarter, to make the game happen. You know, you really wanted to be able to create the vision you had for a CRPG, you know, in the absence of obligation to, to you know, a publisher or an IP holder. Um, and, and at some point during that process, the origin of a, a pen and paper game also came to be. So, so what was what was that process like? Did, did some of the pen and paper concepts predate the computer game or was it in tandem or was it a system that was developed later? in the development process. What's the what's the origin story there? Yeah, so uh, your description of how things came about is pretty accurate. Um, you know, we wanted to make a crowdfunded game. We thought an Infinity Engine style game would be a great, a great thing to pitch. And we uh, crowdfunded um, Pillars of Eternity and Deadfire, obviously with the help of tens of thousands of fans, which was great. Um, a lot of my approach toward creating the system for the CRPGs was actually to not um, feel very bound by the physical limitations of tabletop games in the sense of physical dice that have to be polyhedrons um, and and math that uh, you, know, you would have to be able to do at a table. That wasn't a requirement. So we do percentage operators and we do all sorts of stuff. Um, and 
then during dead fires crowdfunding uh fergus urquhart who was then the um ceo of the company is still our studio head he suggested to me hey how about as a backer reward um you could do a, a pillars of eternity tabletop starter guide and I said, I will only do that if I can do it exactly the way that I want to do it. And I'm not going to listen to anybody's opinion that I don't think is worth listening to. Um, because when it comes to CRPGs, uh, and especially things that are backed by people, there are expectations there that I have to fulfill. And, you know, that's not necessarily like a solemn blood oath. But, you know, they're expecting a game that's kind of like Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale at the very least. Whereas with a tabletop game, I said, look, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna design a tabletop game, then I'm gonna design it the way that I wanna do it and I'm just gonna kinda take my time on it. Uh, and that was the genesis of it. And I did make the starter guide. Um, and it was kind of a mishmash of a bunch of different elements I liked from systems that I thought might work well together. And it's evolved over the years since the starter guide came out into something that is more of a playable alpha. And um, then when we started working with Russell on the Foundry implementation, uh, which was very critical for me running the system during quarantine, um, then uh, yeah, things started really taking off and there was a lot of iteration on it. So that's kind of the, the course that has taken us to where we are now. Yeah, amazing. I, I think, you know, it's, it's a really cool story and I think Obsidian, has a great reputation as a success story for for following that model and achieving a good degree of independence with what you've made and and i think that's that's very cool to see especially as someone who also is sort of a independent entrepreneur you know starting this this whole foundry enterprise like it, it's cool to to see that that kind of um independence in in the creative space um i i want to bring russell in but but before i do that i i'm curious to hear a little bit more about that process of navigating between the pen and paper rule set and the mechanics that are at the heart of the computer RPG. Because I imagine that there's certain mechanics that work really well in both contexts and can, can have a degree of parity. And then there's probably some areas where the, the tabletop game is philosophically pretty different than the computer game. Like, what stands out to you the most in terms of areas where there's that parity and areas where there's a more strong divergence? Um, I think that the key thing, so I should say that uh, before I did this, a lot of people were um, saying, hey, can you do a uh, like a fifth ed conversion? And I was like, just play D&D. Like, I don't, <laughs> I mean, like, there's nothing wrong with that. Just play D&D and I like create a way, like take the world of Aora. And if you want to yeah. play D&D in it, that's great. And yeah, ciphers are not really in D and D, and there are a little some differences, but I just didn't kind of see the point. And when I was looking at adapting pillars into tabletop, even though very clearly we use Dungeons and Dragons as our inspiration for the pillars system, um, it wasn't important to me to actually replicate the mechanics. The important mm -hmm. thing was. If you played Pillars of Eternity and you were like, I want to play, I love my Pillars of Eternity character, I want to play them in tabletop. Yeah. That's the important thing, is that you can make the type of character that can do the sorts of things that you could do in the computer games. Um, so if you want to play a character who can bond to an animal, that's important. Like, you should be able to do that. If you want to create a character who is more or less a cipher, you should be able to do that. The specific mechanisms to doing that Obviously, they shouldn't feel like they shouldn't feel wrong or we're like, well, that's not really doesn't feel right. It doesn't capture the same spirit. But if the mechanic that I use captures the spirit, it doesn't really matter if it's mechanistically close to like all of this stuff with dice is an abstraction layer where we're trying to simulate randomness yeah. and other things happening. And that's a means to an end, which isn't to say that every mechanic is interchangeable, but that. I want to, if you want to play your ranger with an animal companion, then I want to let you do that, even though it's a classless system that doesn't really have that. So uh, a lot of what I was doing was trying to find ways to allow you to make the characters you wanted to make, to do the things you wanted to do without necessarily being bound by the computer mechanisms. Because as Rus Russell and I were talking about, um, 
I can't remember. Oh, we were talking about like uh, generating resources. Some classes and characters like ciphers and monks. I still haven't worked out exactly how their resources should should be generated. And Russell said, please don't. Please don't make this something that only a computer can do. And I said, I, you're right. I'm not. I'm not going to. I want it to be something that you can actually play with physical dice at a table, and normal human beings can compute. Um, but while we're on Foundry, it is it is nice that it can automate that stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think that's absolutely right. And you know, hopefully, if the game is still playable at a conventional table with conventional dice and conventional human brains that aren't going to do complex arithmetic in, in a split second, you know, that preserves the, the authenticity of the game system while still allowing for a lot of automation to, you know, a lot of that ends up being sort of optional depth that you can unlock that isn't required in order to roleplay, but, you know, can give a different sort of experience for different sorts of players. Yeah. Um, Russell, I'm curious to hear from you. I mean, it's pretty cool that you've been in at sort of the ground floor of, um, well, I guess it's fair to say sort of the, the redesign of the Pillars TTRPG rule set. Um, what's been your perspective on seeing the rules come together and some things that fit into Foundry really neatly? And what are some things that are more like off the wall areas where you've been just struggling to figure out how to make it work? Well, it, it's sort of a, sort of like I can't predict it. Some things that I think will be really hard, like tracking token movement and determining whether a token has gone further, like like run, run um, instead of just walking, so they can't use their action next turn. I thought that'd be really hard, but turns out that's super. That was super easy. Nice. And then you know the. The, the whole core dice damage system is pretty complicated, but after some reiteration, especially with the power system, which required a lot of sort of retooling and migrations that caused some headaches, but um, eventually it's gotten into, a, I think, a pretty stable state that I'm pretty proud of. Um, maybe we can show it off at some point if we have time. Um, but it's, it's, it's so cool to me to um, see this or be involved with this as it sort of connects to how I started with role-playing games. That was like Baldur's Gate when I was a little kid and then being the only Kickstarter I've, I've ever kickstarted, which was Pillars of Eternity, and now I'm here. It's like, okay, yeah. whatever. <laughs> just, I, I can't believe it, but you know. Yeah, it's, it's a really cool story and I think it's been one of the most fun things for me about getting involved in this space is the chance to collaborate with different creators who've, you know, like I've admired from afar for a long time. And then here I am, you know, working with an artist or working with a, a writer who's, you know, doing something in the, the tabletop role playing space. And it's a bit surreal. It's cool to be able to, you know, to indulge your, your hobby in, in that in that way. Um, I, think I remember when you sort of posted on Discord, like Josh is using Foundry. That's <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a real holy shit moment for me um, at the at the time. Um, yeah, but uh, I knew I'd made it at that point. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but um, but yeah, no, that was that that was very surreal and continues to be because uh, Josh, you you play a, a recurring game. I think I actually saw you tweet that you've kind of concluded a, a key narrative arc of it pretty recently. Um, how, how long has that game been going for and what what led you to to discover Foundry? Was it a, a direct consequence of, of quarantine and COVID or was it just kind of circumstantial or what's what's the story of the game that you've been running? Um, yeah, so the game, uh, so I had run, this is the third campaign that I've run in the rules. Um, the two previous versions, uh, either due to schedules and other things like burned out, or I did major reworkings of the system where it felt like it was a appropriate to take a pause. The first two campaigns were done in person at Obsidian, and um, I had a lot of experience with virtual tabletops previously, yeah. primarily Roll20. Mm -hmm. um, I played a, excuse me, I played like a two and a half year Ars Magica campaign in Roll20. Um, I played a lot of D&D in Roll20, and um, I actually don't recall where I first saw... Actually, I think it's my high school gaming group. So I was playing playing with my high school gaming group who plays... Um, well, 
<laughs> now we're playing the Aliens RPG. But b before that, we were playing Cyberpunk, and before that, we were playing 5th Edition. And um, we were playing it in Foundry, and I was like, whoa, this seems like really robust. I, I hadn't heard of it. And then uh, I went and looked up the the YouTube um, channel and was watching the videos, and I said, like, this seems really cool. Um, and the more I heard about people integrating their systems into it, I thought, uh, you know, I think this would actually be something pretty cool to look into. Um, at first, I was just using it. <coughs> excuse me. I was just using it with a simple rule system. Um, just like sort of... <laughs> sorry. <coughs> yeah, no problem. I, I remember seeing some of those early tweets of like mm -hmm. using this the simple sort of flexible world building system to sort of... Mm -hmm just be placeholders for, for characters. Yeah. That I presume you were managing offline, but yeah, it was just like a place for us to move things around and, and do dice rolls in a, in a shared space. Um, but then after we were playing and obviously it seemed like quarantine was going to last for a long time. Um, I thought, well, this should really become a focus of system development. I don't have, I can't really program very well. Like I can do very minor scripting, but that is not good enough. And I don't have the time, even if I could, so um, that's why we looked into finding someone. Thankfully, Russell was available. And uh, yeah, he's just been bit by bit. We've been adding more and more systems into it. And uh, the campaign uh, that I'm currently playing in, they, they reached the end of the cause, which is sort of like a one story arc within a campaign. And they've been playing for about a year now. And it's about uh, six, maybe seven players kind of on and off. And uh, yeah, and it's been a great ride. They had a very climactic, a final battle to the cause where uh, one of the most beloved members of the party was killed and everyone got extremely sad, but it was a, it was a noble death in the pursuit of, uh, of the cause. So. That's great. Those are the moments, those are the moments we live for. Um, yep. It, does your, does your game take place like relative to the canonical timeline of Aora established in the games, or is it a little bit outside of that or? Yeah, it's the campaign started five years after the start of Deadfire, so it takes place after the it takes place after the end of Deadfire in the Deerwood, and the Deerwood is pretty messed up by Aethys coming out of uh, Kadnua and then going to the ocean, um, and so there's a lot of strife and, and chaos there. There's a little little bit of civil war going on, um, and the campaign that takes place though, or this the first cause was relatively seemingly low level. It started with a bandit leader that um, the Duke wanted captured for various crimes and misdemeanors. Um, and one of the, one of the things about the cause, so this isn't so much of a mechanical thing as much as a story thing. Um, I think we've all played in, and various games handle this in different ways. But uh, if you've ever played in a D and D game where everyone just kind of makes characters and then the DM has to really like work to get people to go together. Um, the whole point of the cause is that we as a group discuss what the cause is. And in this case, it was hunting down this bandit leader. And then every character had to come up with uh, some connection why they, they would really earnestly want to pursue this to the end. And that could be revenge. It could be money. It could be all sorts of things, but it had to be something where the character really felt directly connected to it, even if they disagreed on how to pursue it. Um, and that was a good way so that right at the beginning of the game, you don't have a bunch of people saying like, mm -hmm. well, I just don't think my character would care about this. <laughs> um, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, it all takes place in, in the Deerwood, which is the setting for the first pillars, um, game. And that's why we used a lot of the maps from the first game. And then I expanded onto some of the areas that are on the world map, but that don't actually have proper maps in the game. Cause you don't go there. Sure. Yeah. I, I think that's a cool example mechanic that the pillar system has with causes because that is a a phase of every new game uh the sort of halfway session zero halfway session one where you know you're really trying to get your players to feel responsible for the the narrative that you're starting to tell and there's there's a lot of sort of gming art form that comes into like how to make that happen but because most systems don't sort of internalize that as as part of the premise um and so i think that's that's pretty neat that that brings that a little bit more front and center as an expectation that's shared by the people at the table um i also like that uh you know I, i'm clearly taking away from this conversation that your home game is is a way that you're testing out all of the narrative threads that will inevitably show up in pillars three um cl clearly clearly that's the takeaway that i should have um i think 
Um, but but no, I mean that sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, Kim, I want to I want to bring you in for a minute. That's kind of kept you. I think Russ has yeah. been. Um, I just if I can ask my own yeah. question, um, Josh, I think you mentioned on Twitter that do you want to like make this into like an adventure path for for p other people to play? Yeah, I mean, I, I shouldn't get ahead of myself because I yeah. still have to release a new Rev of the Rules, which is like three years late at this point. But um, but yeah, I do think that, um, you know, one of the things that I've realized as I've gotten older, even though I'm like, you know, uh, don't have kids or anything like that, is it takes a lot of time to set up and run games. And um, a lot of people are just like, I don't got the time for that. Um, so I, I did think that this introductory cause would be a nice way possibly to bundle up and get people into the system uh, in a setting that people, if they know Pillars, they're fairly familiar with it. Uh, yeah, I think that would be really cool. I don't know what all the work involved in that will be, but I think- I was, cool. I, was, I was thinking about, you know, my module creation brain going. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope that's something that, that can end up happening. I think yeah. I totally agree with you that um, I think really what makes a great piece of, well, I'll call it premium content, in that you know so someone has incurred the expense and effort to really put something together that is of high quality and it's a huge time savings for people who want to sit down and play games because many people love role-playing games, but many people are very busy and yeah. the the level of effort required to run a campaign or a cause at a at a high level of narrative quality with a lot of like engaging and immersive enhancing um sort of add-ons that that en enhance the flavor of the setting it's a lot of work that goes into doing that it's a lot of art assets it's a lot of you know music or or text all of those things require a lot of effort to create and so you know hopefully as the landscape of you know, this is more of my hope speaking, but I hope that as the landscape of premium content for, for Foundry continues to grow, we'll really see, you know, an ever increasing number of like really high quality gameplay experiences that are ready for people to pick up and and, and play. Um, yeah. So I do hope that that, that road, uh, you know, I hope that's a road that you end up following, but no, no pressure. But uh, yeah, I think that would be, I think that'd be re really very cool. Um, Kim, I want to I want to bring you in a bit because you know you uh, know a lot from the perspective of a player about the Pillars games and and the the uh, pen and paper system. Um, do you have some like favorite mechanics or favorite things that you really like about the games or the the pen and paper system that you're excited to see how they translate into Foundry? Yeah. Um... Definitely the thing that stood out to me the most uh, when reading through the rules was just how modular the system was. So as as a player, you get to design your own powers, you get to create your own followers, you get to um, manage your headquarters for the cause. I don't know if any of these concepts are out of date, so they, they might be, no, but... Still in there. <laughs> still in there, yeah. So those, those are really cool. And when I was reading it, um, I was just thinking the whole time about uh, how it might be implemented in a VTT like there's a lot there's a lot of scope like you can do some really cool things with some some cool drag and drop power design UI but that's also a lot of work so um, I don't know if you had uh, if you or Russell had had any insight on on what the direction is that you're taking there yeah I think I'd like Russell to kind of talk about the work he's done on that yeah so Powers are probably the most complicated thing in the virtual tabletop implementation. Um, in this sort of initial beta system, there's nothing fancy. It's just a bunch of um, like distinct elements you can add to a, to a power. Like you can say, oh, I want this power to have four different damage types or like five different targets or three different effects. And, you, know, there's, you can just add whatever you want to it. But the system does automatically calculate, okay, it has all these attributes, it's gonna be a power level whatever. And yeah. so there's a lot of math behind that involved, but you know, it's it's automatically done for you in there. Um, so yeah, I mean, fancy stuff could come later as I sort of refine the UI, but for now it's it's basically functional. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I would say that the um 
You know, like the, unsurprisingly, the inspiration for the whole system is really looking at Ars Magica, which I think is still really one of the, the standard bearers for like great flexible uh, power and magic design. And um, the parameterization is obviously not exactly the same, but it is something that you can do, because <laughs> I did it at the table, um, <laughs> playing Ars Magica, but it is something that you can do at the table on your own. It's it's just simple math, but it's a little cumbersome. But what's great about Russell's implementation is that, yeah, even though the UI is still pretty rudimentary, if you have an idea for a power, you can put that in and figure out what it's gonna cost pretty quickly. Um, and that's, incredibly useful for players that are because you can also improvise powers on the fly and you even have a checkbox for improvised power so if someone says like um i'm a cipher and i have an idea for something that's ciphery let me put this in can i do it okay yeah i can then i'm gonna do it um and that is uh you do have to get players by the way you do have to get players into the mindset that they can do that mm -hmm. which is not easy especially if you're coming from a game that has very static power systems uh, but once players do start to understand that they can just spontaneously come up with ideas for powers and they get how the parameterization works uh they start going wild with it in a good way like it feels very creative and fluid and awesome so really happy that it's going in yeah that's that's really exciting stuff that's super um, cool and it I, it's really appealing to me that there is sort of an underlying abstraction, an underlying framework that governs the way that powers function. Um, I think that's pretty neat that ensures like a, a layer of consistency in how the rules work that, you know, isn't just like a litany of special cases. <laughs> yeah, and some, some of the stuff in there is... Um, you know, there's, I should say that some of it is also a little bit uh, subjective. Like um, if you, if you, the ch it's a later chapter because this is not stuff that players starting out should really be bothering with, but there's uh, the creating new powers uh, uh, guidelines and each power source has its own parameters that more or less there to encourage people to create powers that vibe with the concept of the power source. So for example, Arcana, which is what wizards use, um, it's very cheap to make AOE damage spells or AOE status effect spells. Um, it is virtually impossible to create healing spells unless they also do damage. Um, wizards just can't, they can only create like vampiric effects that heal them. That's it. And that feels very in line with kind of what pillars and D&D magic does. Um, similarly, fighters, uh, it's very cheap for them to do things that are self heals, self buffs, defense, stuff like that. Um, and then there are other things that are more like vibe checks. So the faiths, uh, zeal, um, zeal and faith, which are for paladins and priests respectively, uh, they have more like sort of thematic ideas behind them. Um, and if, if you qualify, then you can give yourself a discount on the power. And that's really something that players and the, the GM can just adjudicate. Um, it doesn't need to be mechanically built in. You just say like, yeah, I get the two point discount. And the GM says like, do you though? Um, so it's kind of like a role playing thing more than a strict power restriction, um, because a lot of this is more conceptual than this isn't a computer game. Yeah. It's a, it's a computer assistance to a tabletop role playing game. And ultimately everyone kind of has to adjudicate things as they see fit. So because wasn't one of like the paladin powers was like, if you say it out loud, it's like cheaper or something like that. Yeah, it is. So, so litanies, um, and this is, again, this is to kind of get that, that vibe where, um, Paladins, uh, they have a mission and you have the mission statement, which is, is is just bullet points of like, this is our thing. And if you make a power and you call it a litany, um, well, one, you get a discount on the action speed of it. So it, it becomes cheaper inherently. But the cost of that is that the name of the power must be literally what you say when you use it and you have to speak it aloud in a strident tone. <laughs> so, um, uh, I actually, now, damn it, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, the one for the uh, Wodokan priests is like super uh, nuts. It's like, um, oh, it's think upon your, uh, think upon your betrayal and die. I think is like the actual like name of the power. I love it. <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah. it's for the, it's for the uh, steel garrote and they avenge um, people who betray their, their promises and contracts. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's to get people to think like, oh, that would be like so cool. <laughs> like here's yeah. this idea for this cool power. 
it fits with what the mission of my paladin order is and i'm going to name it this thing that sounds super badass and every time i use it my character is actually you know like saying it aloud um you know it just it just feels appropriate considering that these are the guys who are so fanatically devoted to a concept that they gain power from it that's that's really yeah. cool system and that's a, a really neat way to reinforce like player engagement at the table as, as yeah. well I like it a lot. Yeah. Do you do a similar thing for like chanter verses or anything like that? Or um, chanter yeah. verses are are more themed, um, and chanter verses are uh, I don't have anything mechanistically for, to like sort of reinforce that stuff. Um, but yeah, the certainly the spirit of how they're named is that they all are they all kind of need to be named after things that sound like they are either poetic or like epic verses or song lyrics or things like that. Um, and it can kind of be whatever you want it to be conceptually, but that is ultimately all that it is, is that they are, they are storytellers that are, they are like literally evoking fragments of memories within the ether. It's kind of like the whole idea of it is that like, you know, you start, you know, you start singing Dear Prudence and there's like some, some fragment in the ether of some dead guy's soul that shattered. And he's like, and like the, all those fragments kind of resonate their memory with what you're doing and that creates the manifestation of of prudence or whatever but that's that's the idea behind chanters so naming things and and how they work uh again it, it's great when the mechanics and the role-playing elements can work together in a way that feels uh very thematically appropriate yeah we've uh, actually been now talking for a little while about some of the really cool design uh, cornerstones of the pillars system i think it would be great to maybe show a little bit of what some of these things look like bearing in mind for everyone watching that this is still under very active development both in terms of how the the mechanics work as well as the implementation thereof in foundry um i don't know um josh or russell if you want to provide any additional caveats beyond that um but well, I can definitely, definitely say that I did not expect this episode of hammering it out, <laughs> and I, well, um, I sort of, I really want to like make the UI pretty, but it's it's basically normal foundry right now. It looks pretty basic, but um, it's pretty functional per the uh, rules that I have currently. So, um, yeah, let's let's go in. Hopefully, we. Sorry about the volume change, folks. Hopefully, uh, on the back end, we will get okay. we will get that calibrated back down. Did I burst everyone's eardrums? <laughs> uh, well, not you specifically. I think when we changed scenes, I think the um, the volume sliders on OBS are at a, a much higher value. But uh, hopefully, it's it's uh, good now. Um, uh, all right, cool. Um, yeah. So uh, what you're all seeing is um, the the view of. A scene. Many of you will, I'm sure, recognize the the beautiful environmental art from the Pillars game. That uh, um, I, I forget whether this area was in one or in Deadfire, but I, this, I this is this is from Deadfire, and I flipped it around and then made some edits. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, this is this is the Bacar this is the uh, Bacarna's uh, laboratory from Deadfire, um, and then uh, yeah, I just but it's not actually that, so that's why I flipped it around and edited it. Um, so this is an area in the current campaign. Actually, actually, this is now, um, after the party cleared this, they kind of thought this would be a cool place for our headquarters. And then um, after they completed the cause, the Duke um, said, sure, knock yourself out. And that's why that's why the map name is Deprecated Grey Willow because it's no longer an adventure space. And there's a new Grey Willow map that is their like headquarters map. Um, but yeah, it was a, this was a site of some some fun, fun hijinks for the party. Is there any um, particular aspect of the game system implementation, Russell or Josh, that you want uh, Matt to to pull up and highlight? I mean, could could be anything really, but just sort I, of show, show folks some cool things. Yeah, I think the character sheet is probably, well, Russell, I don't know. I was thinking the character sheet, since it's up, is a good place to start. Yeah, I mean, for sure, like, it's hard to really get into anything without getting into the weeds. So let's, I mean, let's just explore the character sheet um, and try not to like explain every facet of it. I, I'll try not 
Yeah, um, I think Matt's got that up now. So feel free to just sort of talk us through it, and he'll he'll click along in in tandem. So I think I think one of the things that's interesting to talk about is um, not just with the system, I guess, on Foundry itself, but the system just rules. It's, there's no attribute, and it's all replaced with um, benefits, hindrances, and, and sort of general traits. Um, Josh, why? <laughs> what is <laughs> well, well, we don't have time for me to get into all of that, but I mean, basically, um, I don't know. It's kind of over time, I've found that um, the the sort of fine granularity stat systems um, feel pretty fiddly and often are more of a stumbling block for people than something that feels genuinely good. Um, and often, hey, there we go, exploding dice um, yeah. right away. Um, but one of the things that I found is that you know, people do like attributes because they do want to define something fundamental about my, their character. Like, I'm very strong. I'm a huge Dumbo. I'm like, you know, kind of dexterous or whatever. So people want that. They do want to be able to me mechanically represent that their character is good and bad at things that are more, more fundamental to them than skills, which are obviously more narrowly focused. So what I came back to is, okay, forget about like stat upgrades. And also I didn't really want this game to dive into, you know, stat stacking and, and doing a bunch of math on a spreadsheet, even though you still do have to do a bunch of math on a big spreadsheet, but only in skills. Um, but for something like, um, you know, like hard to kill is a great example because it literally just, it gives your, your, your death threshold. It goes down lower. Eldrin is extremely hard to kill. I mean, like his character in many other ways is also very hard to kill. Um, but even if he goes down hard, it's very unlikely that he's he's going to die. Um, intense gives you that like, you know, that intense feeling in um, it's reflected in all of your social interactions, um, but it requires you to be right next to the, the person you're talking to. Um, all of these benefits and hindrances are meant to kind of capture the feeling that having a high stat would but with a more sort of colorful, narrow focus and uh, just kind of make it binary, like you have it or you don't. And I mean, all my players could be lying to me, but so far no one's really minded that they don't have, they don't mind that they don't have numerical stats for their, their core attributes. They're, they're just fine with this. So it's, it's been good so far. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something I've definitely wanted to uh, try in, uh, in the game and I'm looking forward to it. Um, but as you can see, Matt's been rolling, and sort of the core rolling system is a 2D10 system that has advantage and disadvantage, but that's when you add a D20, and whichever is higher, the 2D10 or the, the D20, is what you use. Um, oh, that's very interesting. Is the, is the explosion triggered on, like, doubles, or...? Yeah, so exploding yeah. on the D10s, on the 2D... So any any initiative or skill or, or power attack roll um, is with 2D10s, and if you get doubles, then it explodes, and you roll it again. If you if you get the same number again, it keeps going. So obviously, like, if you roll doubles on a 2, the ceiling for that is, practically speaking, not going to be as high as if you roll doubles on a, on a 10. Um, it does create... Uh, it does mean that 10% of all rolls obviously, logically, 10% of all rolls will explode, which obviously this is all very feelsy, but um, it feels pretty good. I've played plenty of systems with D10s that explode, and I find that um, if they explode on, or, or, or botch on a 10 and a 1, that's a 20% incidence rate, and that it just feels like a lot. It happens a lot. And so we kind of played around for a while, and right now, exploding up we also did for a while have exploding down which was if you rolled ones twos threes one two threes fours or fives as doubles you would roll and subtract and uh nobody really liked that <laughs> so and it was also a little fiddly and and we said like i just explode up so if you roll that you roll up um and then on a d when you had the d20 in there um so one of the reasons why I like 2D10 is because it's the pyramid distribution. So yeah. it, I know it sounds like a fiddly thing, but it, it feels, the results feel a lot more predictable than they do with yeah. a D20. Like when a character does something and they're pretty good at it, 
they're pretty That's likely fine. to do it. Yeah. And when a character is not very good at it and they're not very likely to do it, they usually don't do it. Um, 2D10 has produced a really good distribution and the explosions on doubles feels good. And then, yeah, the um, the other thing I've been trying to keep in mind with all of this stuff is how many dice do people actually have at the table? Yeah. So using the D20 for advantage and, and disadvantage means that, okay, you have 2D10 and then you have a D20. I know I know that 5E now requires you to have 2D20, but um, but yeah, if 2D10 with, with then uh, the D20 allows for advantage and disadvantage, and then that coming back then creates that wide range. So if you're like, wow, I missed the I missed the flat distribution of the D20. Well, <laughs> you you have it back on advantage and disadvantage, which is where it feels a little more special, I think. What I think works really well with the exploding dice is the so the whole crit system, which the higher you roll, the more dice you add based on how like how much you exceed their defense. So I mean, if I can like possibly um, let's, let's let's see some combat. <laughs> <laughs> see, I, I rolled a 28, so let's see, I crit three times on this, uh, this rogue, and you can see I added 1d6 for, for one crit, 1d6 for a second crit, and then finally the third crit for another d6, and, I mean, if your crit dice have, like, multiple dice, it gets pretty high real quick. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, you, you targeted the fighter and it recorded that, and then when you rolled... Yeah. It knew whether you crit and did all of yeah. that for you. Yeah. And that's what I was talking about with like the complicated damage system because like if you target multiple things, they have to like merge the roles because you don't want to roll separately and have separate roles for each person. You need to label like, oh, this person got this far down the, the crit the, the the crit card and um yeah, so yeah. I know and that defense, the... oh, sorry. I know that defenses, you know, provide a lot of sort of mitigation based defense rather than necessarily I think changing the the target value, but does it, the target value also change, or how how is it determining like whether it's a crit or whether it's a hit? So you roll two d10 and you add either your weapon skill or your power level. Um, well, there's an abstraction. There's a power accuracy that gets added, um, but you you basically roll an attack and then you have the kind of four since third edition defenses. You have deflection, uh, fortitude, reflexes, and will, and then for anything that's damage based. A roll that equals or exceeds is at the very least a hit. And then every five points above that is a crit. Okay. And um, I recently normalized all of the crit damage and crit dice. So it's D6s and D10s. You basically, it was all sorts of crazy stuff before, <laughs> but now it's just D6s and D10s. Um, and the idea is again, like if you're at a table, uh, you should have a common pool of D6s and D10s, which are very easy to get. Um, and then if you're like, I scored eight D10 crit, you're like, great, just grab, roll them up and add them all together. Um, I am, by the way, there is a, there is a logical question, which is it's easy to sort through all this stuff in, um, in a computer, but for tabletop, it becomes a little trickier, but I am coming up with a logical structure whereby you basically start dropping dice from the top in a, in a specific order. So that if you're like, oh, well, this guy just got one, hit, one crit and this guy got three crits, which dice do I drop? And there's a logical order to that. I think it's the the highest damage dice drop first. So if you have more crits, you get the proportionally higher damage. So hopefully it'll be fairly straightforward in tabletop play as well. Nice, cool. I, I also, I notice on the sheet that you've got the sort of division of resource pools between, you know, health and endurance. That's kind of something that pulls in a little bit from the CRPG. Yeah. Um, I, that... I assume... Go ahead, yeah. Russell. Yeah, that's something I really like as well because um, those those divisions within health and endurance are sort of like debuffs. You know, if you get too tired or get too hurt, you start doing worse. And like Eldrin is wearing plate armor and a shield, so he gets tired a lot easier. And if he took those off, you'd see the little threshold go way down, um, which I think is great. I know that the addition of you know the the system for inspirations and afflictions was like a big focus of of dead fire is that something that is approaching the thinking with the the tabletop game or unsure yet or no 
No, we're, we're still using it. Um, and the integration, it doesn't have like direct countering integration in here, but Russell does have effects that can be applied. Um, but yeah, conceptually, we have categories. Now, the thing is, in the computer game, we had attributes, and all of the inspirations and afflictions yeah. were based around those attributes. Mm. Now we have more conceptual groups. So we'll have like ground afflictions or mobility reflections or volition restrictions, which, nah, kind of map similarly to the attributes but so like a mobility restriction would be you're uh hobbled you're hampered um you're paralyzed a uh, volition restriction would be uh confused charmed dominated a ground affliction would be and we actually have tiers of we have prone knocked down and down and out and the reason for these tiers is uh the crit system works with them so if you if you get uh if for every two crits you get uh, an affliction, you can increase the severity of it, or you can make it unshakable. Um, much like fourth edition, you do have the ability to try to save out of an effect. Like if no one can help you and it's your turn, um, again, in a tabletop environment, the expectation of player sort of uh, agency is higher than in a CRPG. If your fighter, if you're playing six characters or five characters in Deadfire, and one of them is paralyzed, for 30 seconds, well, that's just the way it goes. You have a bunch of other characters to play. Um, but if you're sitting down and your fighter that you are playing is paralyzed for five rounds, that sucks. Um, so one, that typically doesn't happen, but two, you always have the ability to shake affliction. Um, but if you get a, if someone gets this double crit on you, they can make it unshakable, which means that the roll is significantly higher to break that. Um, so normally it's a flat check, just like fourth edition, except that you can't modify it at all which is very important um it's always 11 or higher and you break it uh but yeah but the but you can use affliction you can use inspirations to counter afflictions in the same way so for example if someone is hobbled and you give them the swift inspiration that breaks the hobbled immediately so uh that that parallel system does still exist that's really cool i really enjoy that um bring some nice sort of tactical decision making to gameplay in terms of you know, helping your allies and 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 giving them a, a leg up. Um, it's it's very very helpful in 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 combat. Yeah, Kim, I know you had a question about some of the cool sort of like consensus style mechanics that were that are in the system. Oh sure, yeah. Um, like you mentioned earlier, uh, when uh, when you talk about the litanies, um where you can say like i get a plus two because conceptually this this uh, aligns with some of the power rules um and the dm can kind of pull you up on that i noticed that when reading the rules there's a lot quite a lot actually where you defer to the group decision and have yeah. you found uh when you've been play testing this in your your long campaigns that that slows down the game at all no, not usually. I mean, so sometimes people are fine with me just saying, eh, forget it or whatever. It's it's really rare. At least I think it also depends on your group. Sometimes you, mm. sometimes you got players that just they're pushing it, um, <laughs> and just... you need you kind of need that stuff uh, a little bit more. But I think part of it is to under you know I kind of want to take the mentality away from the idea that the GM is the king of everything and like yeah you're you're running the game and everything but the whole point of doing any of this is for everybody to have fun right so sometimes it i think it makes sense especially if you get a weird vibe um i i specifically say like just ask the group so if someone's like hey i think i should get minus two on this because this is a litany of the thing and you go like is it though and then you say, like, everybody, what what do you think? Like, do you think that this qualifies? And the thing is, maybe you'll find that the whole group says, eh, yeah, I do. I think that's right. I think that's that's the way. And you go like, all right. And the, the GM does get a vote, but it just counts the same as anyone else. And the only additional weight is that uh, they're the tiebreaker. So if all of the things are equal the G and the GM votes a certain way, then it goes their way. But in all other cases, it's supposed to be like, if the group thinks it's good, then just kind of go with the group. Um, mm. So in general, I just try to defer back rather than saying the GM must be the arbiter of every single thing solely. Yeah, yeah fair enough. I'm sure it works really well with when you all know each other really well. And yeah, just well, yeah that's, that generally makes it easier. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's really rare that, that we actually have to 
call for stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, like I said, different different groups work different ways, and not all groups are as harmonious. So, mm -hmm. Russell, is there a plan to do, like, a, a voting UI where, like, the checkboxes come up and everyone clicks uh, yes, <laughs> yay or nay? You could ballot. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a valid feature. Definitely not something that is like worth it at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, what no, about uh, um, what about um, sharing or, or giving uh, additional dice to to allies? Kim, you had a question about that because that's one of the cool uh, signature features of the system. Yeah. Yeah. The skill system is super in depth. Like uh, assist yeah, holsters. I think I can. Yeah. There's proxies. I think I can demo the assistance thing here. Um, yeah, there are so, probably yeah. any skills still, but whatever. <laughs> so um, I guess the the whole assistance system is, if you have an ally that has the same skill that you have and they're sufficiently trained in it, they can give you a die to add to yours. Um, and in Foundry, what I've done with the Dice of Nice module is their dice appearance will actually look like their or the dice in your role will look like their dice um in their dice design whatever they've decided um let me see if i can nice touch i can show no not this one let me see is it eldrin yeah there you go so i think yeah matt's character matt's dice are blue mine are yellow his his skill only gave me a d4, but you can see it right there, and you can also see it in the chat card. Um, what character gave you the dice? Um, which is... Yeah, and by the way, this is just I just stole this from Burning Wheel. <laughs> like, it's it's just it's cool. I think I think it's cool that the idea. I really like specifically the physicality of like this is my die. I give it to you yeah. to help you with your roll, and it's when things kind of become pluses. This is one of the reasons why I'm I'm really big on assisted dice and penalty dice and things like that because I like that one. There's still a random range there. It's not a static like you're gonna definitely get this. Um, and also when it is an assist, you see that die separately and you can see that contribution as a separate thing. Yeah. Um, it's it's easy at the table because you all have usually yeah. different dice sets. Um, but I really want and I know Russell is kind of a pain in the ass, but like. Um, but I, I think it's cool because when people see that come out, it's, yeah, that's my die that's adding into that. And it feels, I think it feels good. Yeah, it definitely yeah. enhances the camaraderie of of the, you know, collective problem solving. Yep. Um, yeah, I was really curious if you were, if you would go to, to those lengths, um, but it, it works really well in the, yeah. the tabletop. Yeah. Well, I, I, have, I have two other sort of quick questions. Um, before we wrap up the the sort of interview portion of, of today's episode. Um, the first is that I know uh, a lot of folks in chat are really enthusiastic about seeing this. Uh, I've seen some comments about people who are really eager to uh, maybe give it a play test or, or, or try it out. I'm sure things are, are evolving and I don't want to hold you to any timelines or anything, but is there anything that you can share about where you are in the process and your hopes for uh, allowing other folks to, you know, to try out the game system. Yeah. Um, so I've been saying I'm going to come out with a new rules rev for like a year and a half. And um, part of it was we we just I kept well, I kept changing things um, and also just being busy with a lot of other things. Um, I do obviously have my normal job. This is all free time stuff that I do. Um, and uh, we now are at the point where we're taking a brief break in the campaign. So we ended one cause. We're, we're gonna we're talking about what we want to do for the next cause, but I want to use that time to decompress a little bit, then come back to the rules and actually codify them. And I'm gonna get some help from some uh, folks at work from our comms team who are going to actually put it into a nice, nice uh, human readable PDF that's not just a stream of 200 like 18 pages of Word docs. Um, cause it's, it's a lot of rules now. Um, so I want to get that into shape and then I don't want to promise anything about, um, you know, the, the VTT module concurrently, but I really want to get them out close to the same amount of time because I do think that, you know, more and more people are using VTTs and I just think Foundry has been a really fantastic platform, uh, for us to play in and for us to test the system. 
And uh, yeah, you can play it at a table with normal dice and paper, but I think playing it in Foundry is just really a lot of fun. So I hope people will be able to get their hands on it soon. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome to hear. Too. And I hope that um, the fact that all of these mechanics are kind of codified into the system implementation in Foundry makes it really easy for people to, you know, to play test it and then to provide feedback that, you know, it, it filters out, I guess, some issues with, you know, were did the did the testers actually implement the rules correctly and therefore <laughs> are providing feedback on the intended rules or, or, yeah. or are, you know, it, there's sort of a an assistance that that having the structure can provide in terms of making it easier to test the intention of the design. Yeah, and I, and I think also, I mean, one of the things that um, I like to believe, and I think Russell actually did say this to me early on, is because my whole career really has been CRPG development, I'm pretty sensitive to like engineering things that will and will not work or will or will not be silly. Yeah. And when they start to kind of get into the silly realm, it's pretty easy to talk me into a different way of doing it because this is kind of what I have to do all the time. I have to have engineers tell me like, yeah, that's not going to work. So, so I think it's been a pretty harmonious way to to go about implementing this stuff. That's super cool. Um, well, I have one last question that hopefully won't be be long, but it is a little bit of a selfish one. I'm just super curious to pick your brain on it uh, since I have you here. Uh, unrelated to the pillars system, but related to you know your previous work, um, you know one thing that has always been a, a cornerstone central sort of part of Foundry's ethos is our emphasis on extensibility, our emphasis on modability um, to allow the community to contribute to the, the systems and the experiences that are able to be played in the platform. So you had uh, an amazing experience in this vein with, with New Vegas as well. In you know, that's a, a game that was extensively modded. You yourself participated in that modding scene. Yep. Um, I'm curious to just sort of hear your thoughts and opinions about the challenges and opportunities of creating a product like that, that is kind of open for the community to then use, abuse, change, modify, uh, further develop. I mean, you have a unique perspective on that, and I'm, I'm curious to just sort of hear your thoughts on, on the matter. Yeah, I mean, I think that modability, uh, it really has to be a focus from the beginning. Um, you, you can't tack on modability. If it's not part of the architecture of how you plan the platform, it's really rough for people to, to get like, you know, it's this idea of like, how do you dig your fig? How do you dig? How do you dig your hands in if you can't even get your fingernails over the like cladding that's around everything? And it's it's the API, the data structures, everything has to be pretty open for people to look at. Um, so when developing, that always has to be something that you, you talk about and acknowledge. Um, I do think sometimes people approach modability as though it's like, oh yeah, just do it. Like, well, that's that's work. Like that's a lot of the work. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I we benefited on New Vegas from the work Bethesda did. I mean, it's not like we made the game moddable. Bethesda did it. That's their engine. And um, their editor and their data formats uh, allowed that stuff to happen. And that's fantastic. Um, you know, on Pillars 1, it was not very moddable. And I think the game suffered because of it. Uh, on Deadfire, we put a lot of effort into giving more access to the data. Um, and we had more modding, um, not necessarily, not like obviously Fallout or Skyrim level, but a lot more modding, which is fantastic. And uh, yeah, for Foundry, I mean, it kind of seems to be, again, not necessarily the entire point, but the ability to bring new systems and, and modules in. So if, if you want to play with the grape juice isometric module, or you want to play with dice so nice, or you want to play with, you know, the special weather effects or any of that stuff, um, you can do that, and that's fantastic. And when it comes to systems, putting your own system, modify that system, I think that stuff is all really, really awesome. And as far as I'm concerned, like, I still have the attitude of, like, go for it. Like, <laughs> I think a good potential integration is the timekeeping modules. Like, um, there's a lot of time-oriented things in the, in the system, and yeah. there's a lot of integration that could be done with the simple calendar or the any sort of time-tracking uh, module. Yeah. Yeah, we're always trying to 
you know, strike the right balance between how assertive should the core software be in a, in a certain dimension and, yeah. and how much of that expectation should be pushed onto systems that they use it in a certain way with regards to timekeeping, you know, how we added a, a, a core sort of world time, server time sort of synchronization underlying API, but we haven't, we haven't actually used that yet at a core level to provide a sort of user facing calendar interface. And that's something that we might do at some point, but it is something that modules are currently filling a, a really important role there, as well as any number of other places uh, around the, the ecosystem. And so I think it's, it's really cool to see how many different creators have been empowered by that to create really diverse experiences. And I think it's, it's really great to see how awesome the the pillar system is looking and some of the unique mechanics that it adds that i think are novel to the space that i don't see other systems doing and so um, Thank you. This, this is really cool to see and it's um it's very very uh personally rewarding for me and for kim and for other folks on our team to um to get to you know to host you and to see um, your creative vision for the the pillars game system coming to life in in foundry vtt so Thank you very much for, for joining us and for working with Russell to uh, to make this happen. Thank you very much. I, I like I said, I, I've loved uh, VTTs for a long time and um, I've used not all of them, but I've used a lot of them. And I really just, I think Foundry is fantastic um, on so many levels. So I really appreciate having the platform uh, to put the system in and to play these games with my friends, not just my friends out here, but like I said, I'm still playing games with my friends from high school. So yeah. that's a really great uh, thing to be able to do. Awesome. Well, that's really uh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much again for joining us. Uh, we're going to let you go and get back to the super secret work <laughs> that you are, are are up to these days. I, I know, I know, I, well, I think I know you're not currently talking yet about the project that you're working on, but right. uh, I'm sure we'll all be um, looking forward eagerly to to hearing an announcement when the time comes for that. So good luck and uh, impress thank us. And we'll all be staying tuned. I'll do my best. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. Thanks so much for your time. All right. I'll give Matt a second to recalibrate our uh, camera positions now that we are down to three. Um, but we are going to go a little bit longer. Uh, Russell will be sticking with us. We're going to cover a couple of, uh, you know, a aspects of community uh, happenings and announcements and just things that are going on of interest in the Foundry community. But I hope you all really enjoyed that, um, that chat with, with Josh. That was really cool to, uh, to have him with us. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, very, very insightful. That's probably the highlight uh, of my uh, of my existence. I think it's probably going to go <laughs> downhill. Oh, okay. I mean, he's a cool guy. I, I definitely definitely enjoyed it. But uh, well, who am I to judge? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into a couple of um, of announcements about things that are going on uh, at the moment. So. Um, in terms of core Foundry development, we recently had a couple of releases. So we've had a stable release in V9 early in sort of middle of April that fixed a bunch of bugs and continues to make V9 just even more stable as a, a long-term thing that you can do. Um, but since releasing that, our team has been really hard at work on V10, and we've gotten the second prototype release of the V10 cycle out. We are hard at work on the third iteration there. We're doing another prototype release because we have some other big features that are still coming in. Um, so expect prototype three coming probably towards the, the latter half of May, and it's going to have some really exciting features included in it. It's got some uh, features that improve um, the definition of package manifests and package functionality for module developers. It's got some amazing new um, features for journals that we are, are that Kim particularly is hard at work prototyping. 
Um, we've got new canvas effects for token vision that um, Ludovic is working on a, a new system that's going to be very robust for handling that. Um, we've had to do some pretty kind of incredible. thoughtful reorganization of the structure of the canvas in order to make that possible, but we're going to be able to empower some really dramatic and, and amazing vision-based effect, vision effects um, that tokens can take advantage of. I've done some work on helping our content creator partners to package up adventure style content in a way that will be able to be distributed. As many of you know, we added like private internal support for the adventure data structure in V9, but that was more of a sort of internal test bed, which we have now had some pretty extensive rounds of testing on, and, and that's going to be exposed for everyone to use in, in V10. Um, and uh, yeah, so amongst those sort of like, those are four pretty substantial components that are all coming in prototype three. Um, and, and that will be later this month. And then we'll be into phases of um, yeah, testing the changes with our developer community. And then later on with our, you know, non-developer user community in, in pursuit of getting um, V10 to a place where we can call it stable. Uh, I think we're still a couple of months away from that, but things are coming along really well. And I think that, uh, I guess I sort of say this every time we have a major version release, but I think that V10 will be the best version of Foundry ever. Um, and I guess that's how it should be. Every version should be the best version ever. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of the, that's kind of the goal, but V10 will be the best version of Foundry ever. Um, and, uh, until V11 comes along. But um, yeah, we're really excited by, by what we're working on there. Um, Russell, what do you look forward to the most? Oh, it's easy. Easiest question ever. Journal entries. Journals, yeah. I, um, I've got modules that have hundreds of journal entries that I would love to just condense down into an easier, sort of more digestible format. Things that I can, for mainly linking purposes, like so I don't have to link I don't have to separate a book out into very distinct, you know, subjects. And for the ability to link directly to them, I can, I think, if I recall from my testing of v, uh, V10, is you can make pages and link to those. Yeah. And uh, so excited. Uh, yeah. Actually, you, I have, you, can, you can link them, yeah. yeah. I have 15 modules to go back and... I guess redo, but uh, that might be a process for that'll take a while. But I'm excited for it. <laughs> We've been using it internally, and you know, I've been using it in my own sort of personal game that I DM a bit, and um, it's it it's a better feeling way to organize related related text and image content. I think it really starts to feel. Um, feel better and i think that we will continue to evaluate the ux of it and continue to make some changes but i think the the division of the top level journal entry with individual pages i think is a i think it's a good design choice that's going to work really nicely with other aspects of the the foundry system as well so like things like when you're documenting all of the room by room locations in an adventure area you know being able to have each room be its own page in an ordered entry that lists all the pages and then you know pin individual pages to the map cross link pages to other pages things like that i, I think um you know th this will be a, a much nicer way to it just gives a whole extra level of sort of hierarchical depth to the way that you can organize your content and that one extra dimension, I think, feels really satisfying to use. For sure. I think that's one of the most important things that Foundry's missing currently is it's a bit of a pain to like have separate journal entries for each room because that quickly gets out of hand just completely. So having it all embedded into one journal is just ace. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's going to be really good. Um, I, I think... I guess I think we probably won't showcase um, V10 content today. What I do think we will uh, do is have a, a dev Q&A stream, like our, our normal sort of dev stream format. 
um, sometime in the next week or so. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff that was added to V10 in Prototype 2 and a lot of stuff that's coming in Prototype 3 that it will be a really good, um, it'll be a really good moment to, to showcase that and to do a dev stream that lets everyone see all the things that have been added. Um, Kim, uh, do you have anything that you want to comment on about our work in progress on journals or save it for the dev stream? I'll, yeah, I'll save it for the dev stream. I've, I've been really thrilled at the feedback so far. Um, I, I've, I've felt that the, the, cause I've, I've been tied up with a lot of the D and D five E release that I feel like I haven't been able to devote too much attention to journals, but the feedback on the amount that I did manage to do, um, was, was far more positive than I was expecting. So that's, um, yeah, we've gotten a lot of great feedback, thoughtful feedback, um, very in-depth feedback from, from some members of the community. It's really appreciated. Um, speaking of your work on the 5e system release, that is, um, obviously a, a pretty significant release for many Foundry users who use that system. Uh, why don't you tell us all a little bit about what uh, D&D 5e version 1.6 has added? Yeah, um, 1.6 we focused on uh, what we call advancements, which uh, kind of the word lost its meaning <laughs> during the course of, of developing. Yeah, it that it was just everything was an advancement. I was typing the word advancement so many times. You um, weren't sure if it was spelled correctly now. Yeah, yeah my my hands don't even know. a word anymore. I, yeah. Um. So what that means though is is anything uh, on your character uh, that progresses uh, as they level up. Um. It's not it's not that narrow. It's like a very a very broad system, but but in terms that the average player can understand, um, when you level up, things change, and we've kind of got an API for, for that, and the core system itself has built a few things on top of that. So we've got hit points advancements, we've got scale advancements, um, and we've got feature grant, granting like features when you level up. And there's plenty more planned. Uh, Jeff has already <laughs> got, got uh, issues created and merge requests um yeah we would be, it, so. Sorry. you you did a, a great amount of work on one six um but we would be remiss um uh, yeah not to highlight the the really great contributions that we got from our community of developers specifically jeff uh goes by arbron on discord um caligo uh i'm i'm trying to think there were a number of others who, of folks who contributed various features, but um, Jeff certainly was the torchbearer for us on on one six, and we had lots of kind of exhausting design conversations about how should advancements work. But once we achieved some consensus about what that system might look like, uh, he did a, t a ton of really great work to um, to bring that vision to life. Yep, yep. We should all all uh, have have a lot to thank Jeff for, uh, for his hard work there. And now we have a really robust advancement system which we can build on um, to handle all aspects of character advancement and for modules to build on and specifically like custom content um, or third party content, I should say, was a, was a focus as well. You know, there's lots of custom classes and subclasses out there that we want to be able to those creators to be able to create it fully synced up with their own compendiums and that they can package up as modules and just work out of the box, integrate into the system. Yeah, it's going to be a really great way to empower homebrew character advancement. Um, well, I say homebrew, but you know, not, not just like home homebrew, but also sort of official premium, uh, mm. you know, premium content from folks that are building on the SRD um, base. Um, so yeah, that's that's new in the 5e world, and, and we'll continue working on that. I think probably we will at some point want to focus on getting 5e integrated with some of the new cool sort of data model system tools that exist yep. in, in v10. So v10 Thanks. adds some underlying APIs to add more sort of structure, uh, validation, cleaning, um, 
you know, migration ability to the way that system data is stored. And so that's probably something that on the 5e side we'll be eager to take advantage of. That might be part of 1.7. I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah, it should solve some long-standing problems with active effects if we have the the type in the yes. If we have the schema for for the thing that's being affected, we know what it's type. It's much easier be. to know for sure if your if your target field is a string or a number than to try and infer that. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that's going to be really nice. We have some other really exciting uh, team news. Um, so we added a, a new part-time member of our core team. Uh, this is Kaora, who is a really super talented artist. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with Kaora's work. Uh, you can find him on Patreon, patreon.com slash Kaora. He is continuing to you know build his Patreon and his, his Patreon community as he has always done, but he is now spending uh, some of his time each week with our team directly and he's helping us with uh to, to sort of drive a, a couple of projects one is a a renovation and sort of next generation of design for for foundry so you'll start to see uh, at some point in the coming month slash months uh the evidence of some new design work that is going to be showing up in various places and the the idea is to keep the raw power and capability of Foundry, but to hope, uh, help it to become more beautiful and user-friendly uh, and intuitive. And so um, we're going to really look forward to, to working on that. And work has already started on that. Uh, and I, I really look forward to the community seeing the first evidence of, of that coming together. Um, we also are working with Kaora on a, a separate project that is a little bit more on the content creation side that is going to be very, very exciting, but nowhere near um, time to, to talk about at the moment. That's going to be much more of a long-term thing. But um, yeah, it's really exciting stuff, uh, really exciting stuff there. I um, thought Kaora came for like, like content, like the D&D &D assets, but it's cool to see that it's actually possibly new uh, UI coming or some such. Yep. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're I, I guess I don't have to keep this necessarily secret. I just don't want to overpromise anything because we don't know exactly what timelines are going to be. Um, but we are going to be working on new uh, UI and, and UX for Foundry that will improve the look and feel of the product. But we're going to start with a facelift, a refresh for the website. Um, and we're going to use that as a test bed for some new design concepts where, you know, we can pretty safely roll them out to the website without affecting people or, or needing that change to be part of a Foundry release or something like that. So you'll, we'll be able to share in the future, we'll be able to share some website improvements. Um, and hopefully everyone will love that, but we'll get feedback. Uh, whenever you change anything, someone will tell you how much they hate it. So we'll get both good and bad feedback. But um, yeah, we're going to we're going to refresh the website and put a, a nicer coat of paint on the way that we present um, Foundry and, and the brand, because uh, that is important. It's something that we haven't necessarily emphasized as much as we ought to. Um, and then after that's done, we will be taking many of those concepts and gradually rolling them into um, Foundry Core, and I think that that will probably end up dovetailing with the long-awaited application v2 uh, work that, you know, sort of underlying API changes to change the way that we render interface elements, and then we'll probably accompany those underlying changes with some user-facing changes for uh, how it looks uh, as well. Yeah, so uh, other other really exciting um, stuff for the team, and this is something that is exciting for the whole community as well, is we are now in May, which means we are rapidly approaching our two-year birthday uh, since Foundry's release in uh, 2020. Uh, it's a huge milestone and pretty incredible. It's incredible both to think that we've achieved this milestone. It's also pretty incredible because it... Um, feels like maybe longer than that and it's amazing to think that it actually has only been two years i i like have mixed 
mixed reflection on it. it both simultaneously feels like it's been a really long time and, and also not so long at all. So my mind can't quite wrap itself around that uh, concept. But yeah, two, year, two years since release uh, later in May. And so we will, as we did last year, be having a, a bunch of sort of fanfare and community events surrounding our birthday celebration. Uh, our birthday, so to speak, itself is on May 25th. Um, but in the period of dates leading up to that and around it, we will be having a, a sale. So Foundry licenses will be at a, available at a discounted price. We will have a hopefully very thoughtful uh, article to share with the community that reflects on the sort of state of things and where we see ourselves and where we hopefully are the direction that we're heading in. Um, so a good chance to sort of reflect on what we've accomplished and look ahead towards the future. Uh, hopefully you'll all get a chance to enjoy reading that. Um, we will be doing some streaming here on Twitch. Like I said, we'll have development streams focused on the functionality in V10. We will also have maybe a, a sort of more um, fun, fun stream looking retrospectively at um, the, the progress that Foundry has made over the years. I think we've got a fun idea for a sort of streamed event as a team to do that. Um, and then we will also have um, some actual play uh, related to PaizoCon and the release of the forthcoming Abomination Vaults module later in May, where the group of folks that got together to play through the beginner box uh, just a few weeks ago will be continuing our journey and uh, heading up to Gauntlet and probably dying a horrible, horrible death. Um, hopefully, uh, if, if you guys didn't get the chance to see our playthrough of the beginner box, it was a two session uh, playthrough. It was pretty entertaining. It was a lot of fun. Those um, videos, I say this with a question mark, are now on YouTube. I, I hear a voice in my head saying, yes, yes, Andrew, they are on YouTube. And you can go to our YouTube channel uh, to watch them if you want to get acquainted with um, our, our characters before we uh, die horribly at the hands of, of Korra, who will be certainly um, bringing the full uh, horrible might of the Abomination Vaults to bear upon our feeble frames. Um, it, it was really fun to watch, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and of course, on that note, the Abomination Vaults premium module will be dropping uh, later this month, and, and we will be jumping straight into it. Um, the team and our collaborators at Paizo, uh, and then our also collaborators at Sigil, who re recently released Outlaws of Alkenstar, all working together to continue improving the way that we are converting and releasing um, Paizo content. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's really coming along and we are also sort of learning as we go. The beginner box release uh, has elicited a lot of great feedback and that feedback is translating into further improvements um, into, into the tools that we make available. So um, I'm really excited for Abomination Vaults. I've only been partially involved in it because I, I have sort of so many different work initiatives that I'm you know, focused on dividing my attention between, but um, the the Abomination Vaults adventure is really looking super great. And I think with another couple weeks of final polishing, it's going to come together and be um, be really amazing for, for folks to pick up and play. Um, yeah, okay, so that's some team news. Uh, let's jump into some content roundup of stuff that has released recently for Foundry. I mean, we're sort of already talking about this with Abomination Vaults. Um, we had a, a free map pack that released today from Brave New World, which is kind of a joint collab between a map artist and a musician who both created some amazing work independently, but they've set up a new sort of joint endeavor. Uh, it's called Brave New World. They are on Patreon, and that content has released on uh, Foundry under our exclusive content section today, which means it's free for everybody to install. It includes 
uh, a number of really beautiful um, battle maps that are exactly you know pre-configured and ready for you to pull into your game so you can install those and have I don't recall offhand exactly how many maps, but it's a good number and they are really, really beautifully done. And so you can get that module installed and have um, some some lovely environments to just use for random encounters or to make a part of your upcoming plot narrative, throw your players at them. Um, and then you can get more besides by supporting Brave New Worlds on Patreon, where there have, um, you can find them at patreon.com slash brave new worlds. And I'll link that in uh, in chat or maybe I'll get someone else to um, while I uh, highlight uh, the, the next release that we have. Um, we One of our very first uh, exclusive content releases, it might have even been the first, I don't recall for sure, but Adventure Music um, is a, a composer who creates some really fantastic sort of thematic, iconic music to use to, to underscore your tabletop role-playing adventures. And Adventure Music has released a big update to their uh, freebie uh, portfolio. And so you can install the uh, Adventure Music sort of anthology pack uh, and get a bunch of, um, there's 20 new tracks that have been added. So a, a really good variety of music for all kinds of different gameplay situations that are um, ready to use. Um, and so that's another one that is... Uh... Yeah, I think there are... I see a question from chat. I think there are uh, included sounds in the the Brave New World map pack. So that's a pretty cool... I guess because uh, Sean McRow Music, who we worked with previously, is sort of directly involved in that uh, collaboration, I think there's a kind of definite emphasis on audio as, as part of that. Um, I love all the exclusive free uh, music and sound, so I'll need to update. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's, ama it's an amazing way to get a, a, a really great baseline portfolio of audio, maps, tokens, whatnot that you can use for playing. And so anyone who buys Foundry can instantly have a starting like a starter library i think that's one of the, the key goals that this category serves for us and it also really helps these creators who it gives a way to really make it easy for them to let people try out and and check out their work and hopefully for people who really enjoy and like what folks like brave new world and adventure music and and uh, domino's wondrous works so i'm going to comment on in just a second hopefully folks who really like what these creators are doing will then go and support them on Patreon to get even more stuff in the same uh, in the same vein. Yes. Speaking of which, uh, Domil released a new exclusive pack uh, with a bunch of phased battle maps. Uh, so this is kind of her thing, her signature hallmark of the way that she does map making is she creates uh, kind of staggered narratives over time of um, map environments that change over the course of an encounter. Um, and that could be possibly just because of the progression of time, it could be in response to actions that the players take. But either way, all of her maps have what are called phases and her module actually builds in a UI based tool to transition between the different uh, phases of a, a module uh, of a map and so while your players are are undertaking this really epic encounter you can kind of step through the different phases and each one intro each additional phase introduces a sort of dramatic turn of events in terms of like the the circumstances of the map um that really accentuates the the narrative of what your players are experiencing. So definitely encourage folks to check out um, Domil's pack on that. And then for more of her content, again, you can find her on Patreon uh, at patreon.com slash domilww. Oh gosh, I don't want to get this wrong. Let me actually make sure I'm giving the correct Patreon URL. I think Yes, patreon.com slash DWW. I knew it wasn't exactly Domil. Uh, DWW on Patreon is where you can get um, Domil's uh, more of her more of her wonderful work. 
Um, cool. Let's see. All right, yeah, moving on. Uh, premium content. So that those modules were ones that are all available to be installed for free. Anyone with a Foundry license can get those installed. It's a free freebies that come just included with your your Foundry purchase. Uh, however, we do have a number of really great pieces of premium content which you can pay to have the kind of extra over the top uh, experience with with all of the great stuff included. And so we would be amiss since we have Russell here uh, to not emphasize some of the awesome uh, Cubicle 7 releases that have come out recently. Um, we've got the Wrath and Glory Forsaken System Player's Guide. We've got Uber's Reich Adventures 2 for uh, Fantasy, and then the Soulbound Starter Set. Russell, why don't you tell a little bit about each of those and, and what you're working on in, in Warhammer Land? So, um, yeah, uh, Uber's Reich Adventures is a, set, a collection of adventures that pair really well with the Warhammer Starter Set. So, um, the starter set provides the setting while Uber's Reich Adventures 1 and 2 gives you a lot of really cool sort of incidents or things for your players to partake in. Um, the Soulbound starter set is a good introduction to the relatively new Age of Sigmar Soulbound system that uh, I've been working on. Um, and it provides a nice, like the Warhammer Fantasy starter set, it provides a nice setting, a city that uh, the players can explore and do the sort of main adventure in which is going underneath the city to the depths below um and in the 40k side the forsaken system adds a bunch of player options so a lot of lore a lot of new sort of classes or archetypes your players can um can use and it pairs well with the, the system update that sort of integrated that archetype system for easy character creation. Um, but yeah. Nice. Awesome stuff. I love seeing the just sustained quality that comes out of the pipeline for different Warhammer systems. It's really great to just have such a wealth of content available um, yeah. on, on Foundry. Um, it's been pretty quiet lately, but the next sort of trio of modules is coming soon, so keep an eye out. Yep. Nice. Um, already alluded and mentioned the release of some Pathfinder stuff, so the Pathfinder Beginner Box is available for purchase on paizo.com, uh, and it, it contains everything you need to, to get started playing Pathfinder. Second edition in Foundry VTT. It's a really amazing product to help you get started. Really recommend it. Um, we were involved directly in creating that package, and so uh, it's certainly something that uh, we feel proud of the sort of polish that it it achieves in terms of how it works in in Foundry VTT. And as a follow up on that, our partners at Paizo and Sigil have released uh, Chapter One or book one, rather, of Outlaws of Alkenstar, uh, Punks in a Powder Keg, which is their brand new uh, adventure path that has a bit of a sort of Western slash steampunk slash uh, kind of outlaw style uh, vibe to it uh, that's a really fun sort of atmosphere, and it takes place in the, the city of Alkenstar, which is sort of a bit of uncharted territory, I think, for um, the Paizo IP. And so it's really exciting to see them expanding in that direction. And it's a really neat adventure path that uh, is available to pick up and play. Uh, the subsequent chapters of Outlaws of Alkenstar will be available, uh, hopefully, ideally, on their street release dates uh, as, chap as books two and three are released. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, we have Abomination Vaults coming up uh, later in May. So definitely some great things happening on the Paizo and Pathfinder fronts. Um, we also can really celebrate the arrival, uh, the addition of a, a really uh, prodigiously productive Patreon creator to our Patreon membership integration system. So that's uh, the Mad Cartographer, who is one of the preeminent map makers, uh, asset makers for Foundry VTT. Um, Mad Cartographer Alex is now, and well, it's not just him anymore, he's got a whole team uh, working on this amazing stuff, but Alex and his team are integrated with our Patreon membership. So if you are a supporter 
of the Mad Cartographer on Patreon. You have to be at his uh, tier that gives you Foundry access. But if you support the Mad Cartographer on Patreon, you can link your Patreon account on the Foundry VTT website, and you will be able to install uh, all of his Patreon content uh, that he releases every month um, through the Mad Cartographer directly into Foundry as premium content once your account is linked. Um, so I know that many, many of you out there are supporters of Alex and Mad Cartographer on Patreon. Be sure to link your account on the website and check out his stuff and get it installed in Foundry. It's really easy to do and you can get going with some really amazing maps and little like built-in adventure prompts that, that go along with them. Um, and, you know, we're really excited to continue growing our, our relationship with different Patreon creators who are using, well, both ones who are using that integration system and ones who are not. But we're especially excited to, you know, to work with folks who are able to integrate with our Patreon authorization system to offer premium content to their subscribers that way. I think that's a really cool way to, you know, help those artists get, uh, you know, get supporters and get paid, and then and then a good way to get their premium content onto Foundry um, in a in a really seamless way. Um, we have had some really great uh, releases of one shot ready to play adventures from Dragon's Horn Tales. Uh, so, Crypt of the Fallen Cult and Temple of the Blood God are both uh, adventures that uh, can either be tailored as low lower level adventures or higher level adventures so it's a cool thing there's a lot of flexibility built into the stuff that dragonsorn releases where you can change the uh difficulty tier of the adventure but it also you can even support different game systems so uh, for example like temple of the blood god it works for either uh fifth edition or 3.5e and uh, sorry about the background noise um fifth edition or 3.5e and it also can be tailored for either uh level four to six or sort of level five to nine for a higher level experience so um yeah so it, it's pretty uh it, it's pretty flexible and, and i think that's one thing one very cool thing that regalt and uh, dragon's horn are doing with their releases to make it easy for people to who pick them up to fit those into an existing game campaign that you're playing. Um, all right, what's next? We've got premium content for uh, Das Schwarze Auge. It's my best my best attempt. DSA, uh, the Dark Guy. Um, and uh, from Ulysses Spila, uh, also doing great content for Torg Eternity. Um, but yeah, the, the Aventurian Compendium for DSA, the Nile Empire for Torg, um, yeah, so uh, really great uh, expansions of their content, and, and much like Cubicle 7, Ulysses just keeps releasing pack after pack after pack, and they're doing it at a really high quality. It's amazing stuff uh, coming from them, and you know, also starting to come for some of their products in English as well, so all of them are releasing first and foremost for their, you know, sort of native German audience, but English translations are coming and have come for a number of DSA uh, packages already. So um, that's also pretty cool that localization to, to m support multiple languages is, is coming there. Uh, I've also got a note that um, the Dungeon Crawl Classics system has released two classic low-level adventures, The Portal Under the Stars and Doom of the Savage Kings. Um, so between those two adventures, you unlock access to 50 new items, roll tables, rumors, dozen NPCs, uh, and adventure areas that can challenge your, your players. So that's a really good uh, pair of adventures that you can use to really try out kind of a old school classic dungeon crawl classic system that um you know maybe you haven't had the chance to to try um before but if you want to get your feet wet the system is available to install for free but this content can give you that kind of premium experience if you want to do an adventure with your group i really encourage you all to check that out as well i think that about does it for my content roundup although we are just announcing new stuff every day that is available for Foundry, and it is super exciting to see this all um, 
you know, coming out with such, uh, you know, such regularity and, and, you know, with such high level of quality. It's really, it's really amazing to see. We've been, I won't say struggling, but we have been working hard to keep up with the velocity of the content pipeline that is, is being put out. And Matt on our team has been a real champion for making sure that all of those launches have gone so smoothly and that our relationships with our publisher partners are as, uh, growing as, as well as ever. Um, so yes, um, that is about the end of my script. Uh, Kim or Russell, do either of you have things that you'd like to highlight or shout out? Um, uh, no, no, nothing for me, I don't think. I'm curious about y'all, but I am going to Gen Con this year at the Warhammer booth, so if anyone is going in chat and you want to meet, just just let me know. I don't know if, if what y'all plan what y'all's plans are. But... We have not really announced our plans yet. Um, and we are still figuring them out, but I will be at Gen Con. And okay. I think um, I think it possibly some other folks from our team will be at Gen Con as well. Uh, we will be sharing some details on that in the coming weeks and months, but I'm excited to hear that you will be there, and I'll look forward to um, hanging out with you in person at, at Gen Con, and everyone else from the Foundry community who will be in attendance this year. Sorry to like undercut you there <laughs> with the timing, but... Uh... No, 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 no undercut at all. I, I think that's, that's really exciting, and it's a great, it's a great chance uh, to, to meet up with folks who otherwise we only see, uh, see online. Yeah, I'm very excited. I've always dreamt for like a foundry con, but this will do. <laughs> in, in the meantime, yes, we will we will uh, we will appropriate other conventions and make them, you know, foundry con uh, in name. Um, yeah. Kim, anything from you? Oh, I guess I already asked you that. I won't ask you I again. So. I won't ask you a third I time. I was trying to think. Um, I was trying to think, but I don't think there's anything. No. Okay, well, in that case, I think this is a great time to wrap up, and I would like to say a very special thanks to Kim for co-hosting with me, to Russell for joining and sharing your perspective and insight on the system creation process for Pillars of Eternity, and then most uh, significantly to Josh Sawyer for joining us and being our special guest today and sharing his wisdom and perspective and uh, uh, on all things uh, role-playing related. Uh, it was a really pleasure to get the chance to chat with him, and I thank all of you in the audience for sticking with us, and I hope you found this interesting. We will be back on Twitch soon with a dev Q&A, uh, and stay tuned for all of the correspondence and um, stuff related to our two-year anniversary celebration that we'll be starting later this May, and I hope you'll all uh, join us for that and look forward to it. Um, but for now, that brings this special episode of Hammering It Out to a close. Um, so thank you all very much, and we will see you next time. Farewell. Thanks. Thanks.